Hello viewers, today we are back once again with our social issue topic, our social issue commentary to discuss on the issues in Nagaland and Northeast. And we are glad to have here with us our panelists and uh, would like to introduce ourselves once again. I am Wabang Mwa, Director of Highland Down Media. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Viget Tule. I'm from State Mental Health Institute. I'm Kevin Meru. I do freelancing ministries as well as I'm teaching in Asian Evangelical Bible Seminary. Hello, my name is Jose Zorrako and I'm the author of the book The Invisible Warfare. Thank you all for being here once again and we have our guest Jose Zorrako and uh, today our topic is related to Christianity in Nagaland. It's actually a topic meant for Christians but also we know that other, other brothers and sisters will be watching and so we want to make Sure, this topic is understood by all. Is it's important? I feel, and we believe, for our believers here also in Nagaland, and uh, it's the the name of the topic is nominalism. So nominalism is a widespread thing, phenomenon all over the world. Many religions they face it. What exactly is nominalism? Because again, once again, you know we are almost almost ninety percent Christian here in Nagaland, and so we want to discuss about this. And we want to get to know what exactly is nominalism, how it's affecting our churches, our society, our workplace, everything. So we want to again uh, get a definition about it. And so uh, Mr. Jose Zorako has written a book uh, related to this. And uh, I think this is the, the, one, uh, yeah. the, the title of the book is Invisible Warfare. And it's uh, a chapter in it uh, very prominent about nominalism among Christianity, among Christians. So firstly, a uh, definition of the word and what nominalism is, is in Nagaland. Who is it? Okay, like our story said, the nominalism is a widespread religious phenomenon and it crosses to all aspects of life, not only uh, the religious uh, field, but also the social political field. But coming to the Christian, to the Christendom, you know, uh, nominalism, the best definition would be a uh, lukewarm Christian. Where a person is not neither a gray, a Christian is neither a white Christian or a black Christian, but he or she is stuck in the middle, and so like a lukewarm Christian. And so when we look at our churches today, in our Christendom, there are a lot of nominal, nominal spirit or say like the nominal, the effect of nominalism in the churches or in, or also in the, you know, among the believers. A Christian, we call us a Christian, but most of the time we don't want to, you know, give give our bad habits. Or like say we, do, we we want or we are attracted to the last of the world and so how can we define ourselves a christian so i, I guess the best definition of, of, of nominalism would be a person who is stuck in the middle neither a, a prominent or a uh, dedicated christian or neither a, he he is not a christian so. mm. being a lukewarm yeah, look christian. christian okay yeah. so i mean like mm. uh, we are naga christians are being so used to be christian with the term as well as all of us go to churches and all that and we are brought up from childhood in churches and we know we know we very well know the bible also even so uh, uh can we can we uh also decide you know what is happening in our churches now perhaps reverend kevy well i would like to th thank you for the uh definition also, I'm thinking of it in the most sim simple term. Nominalism is Christian in name only. You have the name Christian, you fill up the form, what religion, you say Christian, but that's all there is to it, you know. Exactly. You're not. Whereas in the Bible, Christ said, uh, the Second Timothy 2.19, I think, or 1.19, those who name the name of Christ should depart from iniquity. The latter part, many of us are not following. And I was also thinking of the church in Laodicea, you know, that's a perfect description for nominalism. They thought everything was going all right. But Jesus said, you are blind, you are naked, you are poor, in terms of the spiritual. So, I think some of that may be happening in Nagaland. And that is widely manifested when election time comes. Many churches are exposed. Churches fight over it. Villages, they try to control people, even by siding with one candidate. I think this... Uh, uh, I'm maybe jumping ahead, but I'm giving examples and we can move on. So these are happening and then one time, one incident was so bad, they will ban people from moving and whatnot. So I said, the Holy Spirit has left the building and the people didn't know it, you know. So 
we say Christian in name, but are we moving with the Holy Spirit? We need to ask those too. So mm. we'll come mm. again on some of those okay. areas there. Like <coughs> even, for example, we say we are living in a Christian majority land, but uh, what about those other non-Christians living in our land or living in other states? How do they view us? You know, Are we really Christian to them? Or are we a stumbling block perhaps You know, through our actions or through the lives we lead? So uh, mm. in a... Uh, Perhaps from a non-local perspective, do you would you say something, mm -hmm. Doctor? Mm. One problem with the Christian majority majority state is, uh, uh, you know, too much uh, qu quantity dilutes quality. This is our problem. Mm. Too much Christian uh, Christianity is the uh, major religion in Nagaland. Uh, we can proudly say we are about ninety percent. So I believe the number, the number has diluted the quality of our Christianity. And also over the years, uh, we also see that uh, materialism has uh, badly affected uh, the uh, mm. quality of our Christianity. Mm. Christianity thrives wherever there, the conditions are hard, living conditions are hard. Wherever there is persecution, Christianity thrives. And there we get good quality Christians. But here in our Nagaland context, uh, we live in very, very easy times. And nominalism thrives under easy conditions. Mm -hmm. And That's like you true. said, a lot of materialism going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our people are really going crazy after money, perhaps. So what is uh, the love of money? The love of money, mm -hmm. the root of all evil. To put a little biblical background to that, Moses also warned the people, once you enter Canaan, there are some fields ready that you, you, you hardly have to work, house buildings and all, you are going to inherit those. And once you become plenty, he said, don't forget God, and which is what they did, and they went into through many judgments and troubles. So that's happening. In Nagaland, I think when we have all the creature comforts, you know, people, human nature get lazy and uh, whatnot. Mm -hmm. But one good thing about Christianity in Nagaland is that among the bad parts too but one good thing is that people are still coming to Christ out non nagas let's put it that way come here and they're coming to Christ mm. here and there because the Holy Spirit is working that's to show that, that the true gospel is still flourishing there are some still genuine believers there who are seeking the Lord with all their hearts uh, so for example I think all of you will have something to say about that uh, the, the Nepali community Many of them have been converted from Nagaland. Some have moved back and they're doing great ministries, mm -hmm. reaching a lot of people. And Nagaland has been legendary in that sense. Even mm -hmm. foreigners come, I heard, they say they got converted from Nagaland and all. So they hear good things about it. Mm -hmm. So that's a mm -hmm. very good positive part is going on. Well, another, too. that's right, related to that. <coughs> even in Arunachal Pradesh, perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the work of the Nagas has really laid, laid the ground for the growth of the churches. And talking about the materialism and also Perhaps we are also quite uh, light-hearted, you know, mm. the term, light-hearted, or we are too easy-going, perhaps. Or again, many times we do our own thing. It's like uh, many press people, they say, cushy, cushy. Mm. We do our own cushy <coughs> all the time. So uh, what could be, I mean, like they said, because of we are a Christian majority, we are living in a comfortable place, we are, there is no persecution. So how could we come out of this laid-back attitude also? I think this is the curse of our generation. We're living in very good times, mm -hmm. lots of uh, good things, luxuries, mm -hmm. comforts, pleasures. Mm -hmm. And this uh, are so addictive that uh, the average Christians have become uh, very vulnerable to nominalism. This is uh, the way I see. Mm -hmm. And if you really want Christianity to thrive, we must go through some very, very hard times. I think also there should be a a time of ma maturing process because along with uh, education and literacy and we're opening up our eyes and then slowly we're going through some kind of transition we still have the old guard the older generations there they have their way of thinking is slightly different from the younger generations for example even the, during the 1990s after the mobile phone came many things changed so in that sense we're also going through some transition I think now many theologically trained pastors are there. No? Before it was not. Still, the, old, the other people, they did a good job. But some, in some areas, I think the danger is 
some people who who have no training but they become leader and they don't want to give place to the one who are fresh fresh blood so to speak you know so that's also an, another issue and that also prevents growth of christianity one thing uh, okay to be strong is that yes like the revival prayer fasting and all but we need very good teachings of the word of god mm. to permeate the churches many we have so much deficiency in this area the i think one point is yeah, that, yeah that's yeah. the one i, I yeah, from I, my side i, I think quite agree with that balance of that yeah. you know mm-hmm. we need a very good teaching plus we True. also need the uh, i should say the uh, revival style of uh, Mm. Uh, strong prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting, yes, yes. So that's we, wonderful. We back, really backed up by a strong teaching of the word. Yes. Yes. Mm. Spiritual mm. power is very much lacking in many of our churches. Mm. So mm. that, yeah. Yes. Yes. Because I'm inclined yeah. with that, like as we are saying, we are we boast for having a 90 percent Christianity. Mm. So, like as we look at the past, at the genesis of our Christianity in the 60s, 70s, 80s, we face a lot of persecution, mm. like from the the oldest armed forces and all. So. People say that there was not a single person, you know, who don't pray. The Nagas, especially, mm-hmm. like they they fled to the villages because they couldn't stay in the in the village. So they went to the jungle, and then you know there was so chaos going on. So at that very moment, uh, uh, the historian says, or like all the church pioneers say that there was not a single individual that they were not praying. Like wherever they they see people, they are gathering and they are praying. They are holding hands, then they are praying. So that was a time of persecution for the Nagas. Mm-hmm. So. My question here is that: Are we waiting for such kind of persecution again? Mm-hmm. Are we waiting for such kind of persecution, such kind of you know turmoils? Then only we'll start praying. That is the question. So at this very juncture, we need to really seriously think and we need to pray hard, because mm-hmm. I believe that Naga is a you know is a place we, we, that is anointed, and you know it, it's a very fruitful place where God has a specific and you know beautiful plan and purpose for our people. And so, coming to Christianity again. Uh, according to my experience, also, I and mean, then if we look around, whenever our faith is put on trial, or our faith, or some people say like some non-faith, they question us about our faith. May, whether we may be in the booth join, or whether we may be in some clubs, or whether we may be in some, you know, college school, college, or wherever, we are ready to defend our faith. Mm. But so, like, why don't we defend our faith in a good way through our lifestyle mm. by living a you know Christ-like life? And be an apologetic and def- defend our faith in the right way, not in the wrong way. Mm-hmm. So that is what I want to see. Yes, yes. But he, he brought a very relevant point. Yeah. In yeah. times of crisis, people come, mm-hmm. flock to churches. Yeah. Exactly. I rem- I was remembering 9/11 in the mm-hmm. US. After mm-hmm. that, many churches were overflowing with mm-hmm. attendance. Now it's uh, the dying again. <laughs> Just want to compliment on what mm-hmm. he has said. 1959. Okay. Th- that was the height of uh, arm operation against the Naga insurgent. Nagaland experienced the first revival outbreak. Yeah. You have rightly said, the such times when we are persecuted, when we are severely oppressed, when we go through some really hard economic uh, conditions, well, such times you know drives us to yeah. words yeah. God. Yeah. Of course, keeping aside that, uh, we seem somehow we have, everybody is. Uh, seem to have become so com- complacent and so comfortable with the times, mm. including the preachers, not only the average Christians like yeah. us, but also the preachers, the pastors. Everyone has become so comfortable with the times now. Mm. And uh, besides materialism, the present uh, technological innovations like the internet, mobile, almost everything is affecting our uh, faith and our uh, quality of uh, the quality of our Christianity. Mm. So uh, we seem to be lacking some very fiery uh, brand of uh, preachers, you know, uh, who can really steer us up from our slumber. Mm. Yeah. Yes. To I think to cut to the root of nominalism, to be a genuine Christian, Jesus himself said, "You must be born again," right? So we know that uh, they say that God has no grandchildren. That means just because you are a Christian does not mean your children are Christian, though they may take the name. Mm-hmm. They need a heart transformation, personally, to experience that. In that sense, there, there, no, God has no grandchildren. Everybody has to come <laughs> through Christ and <laughs> have a change of heart. Yeah. Just yeah. talking yeah. to that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this goes for both Baptists, all Baptist revival, and Catholics, Roman Catholics. Don't think you are a Christian because you join a denomination. Okay, I'm not uh, knocking on any single denomination. It's for Baptists. It's for Catholics to know that. We need to be born again from the heart, not just because I joined a Catholic 
or I joined the Baptist and I'm going through the motions, you know. That does I think people are some people are lost in that. They don't realize that there's a terrible eternity there to choose. And the choosing time is on earth. So I think we need some reflection on that too. Mm. Mm. Okay. You know like we are talking about individual believers but also like what Collective about our leader. workers uh, what about our theologians or or our church leaders also uh, is is there a kind of a, a laid back attitude or is there a kind of a nominalistic a nominalism present in the church of course i want to cite one exam one uh, story regarding okay. this there was a naga missionary and then they went to, to the states And the when they when they went there, um, some you know the some people out there and they blessed them mm -hmm. with clothes with warm clothes, and the the person who blessed them told the pastor not to mention his name, mm -hmm. that he has given he has blessed them because so the pastor asked him why, because if they know that I have blessed them, they will only um like they'll be in awe of him and not awe of God. They will thank him. So they will thank him. Mm. So so he told his attitude was that let them thank God, not me. With, but he was he was the one who blessed them. Mm. So, you know, many times if we see in our churches today, like in the leaders also, like when our name is not acknowledged publicly, mm -hmm. we you know we tend to fight, we tend to get dismay or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think in this area also we need to you know really learn from the people mm -hmm. and for our our faith also, and then we really need to mm -hmm. have a burden, a burden, a zeal to serve God, not only to I mean like for the sake of our profession. But have a burden, a real burden for the lost souls. What about the training or or the uh, the way theology is is being taught in colleges? How, what is the scenery now? Perhaps Reverend can also mention something. Yeah, can oh, I cannot speak for the other institutions. In a way, some basic uh, subjects that needs to be covered are being covered. I don't know the quality of it. So in that sense. It's good, but we have uh, we are producing tons and tons of theological graduates, and it doesn't seem like they're impacting the society in a great way. But again, it comes to the issue of personal transformation, personal heart. Yeah. Lately, I met one uh, deputy director of one department. I will not mention the name. He said, "I have made a covenant with God to be righteous in all my doing." It's very hard sometimes. Pressure comes and all that, but. Financially and in all my duties and all this, he says I, I'm keeping it real. Uh, so that kind of dedication. Once we have that, I think Nagaland will change in a greater way. I think a lot of it is happening in many uh, workers. But okay, uh, right. That's individual believer. And again, about the uh, in your experience, perhaps who says oh, like uh, theology in a theological study set up mm -hmm. or colleges. Uh, is there something to do with, uh, I mean, like academically or spiritually, and uh, you know, how, how is it going on? Okay, like like I said, I can you know generalize every every all the institution mm -hmm. or all the seminaries, but uh, what I can learn or what I can say is that it has to balance. I mean, like the academic and then the spiritual level. So I think there should be a balance, and also, you know, it. Uh, Eighty percent, I should say, so it depends on the individual. So, but also, I mean, like also, uh, I mean, like the teachings on. So, like I, I studied in KBC, and then to do deliverance teachings and all regarding mm -hmm. this all this invisible warfare. Kohima Bible College. Yeah, Kohima Bible College. Yeah. So they they teach us on this spiritual, uh, a specific spiritual spiritual type teachings and all. Mm -hmm. And I believe these these teachings are really needed in our generation today yes. because all these things, you know, we need to have a role model mm -hmm. and we need to see the seeing is believing. So. Unless we see it, we can we can believe it. Mm. So practical think, spirituality, yeah, practical spirituality or what? Yes, yes. You know, I need to say you are one good example of a balance, because you had your background in Patkai, right? You graduated yeah. BA, you had a good command of English already, and you came here, you learned some spiritual stuff, so you can write the book. But one defect uh, I need to say is that many of our theological students, they come with high school, high school graduates like that. I don't blame them because our uh, school mm. system has been very uh, deficient. Yes. We have failed. Many of our teachers have failed our students in that area. They were not being taught well, irresponsible schooling and all that. So sometimes some of the students, they graduate, they say MD, maybe like that. They can hardly write one good, nice sentence. Yes, I, I can see their spiritual import, the, 
their spiritual heart and all they can they are very gung ho for Jesus Christ but their writing when it comes to writing their writing is terrible uh, just I'm not that's the fact I'm just pointing out you know so but so when I saw this one I was very impressed <laughs> in a way not to praise him but I was impressed because it's a basic covering of this the issues not in depth yet many things can be taken in depth even one one area but the, the way he wrote is that it's very good coverage and the, the right English is very so we need more graduates who are <laughs> academically sound and then spiritually trained in the seminaries mm. we need combination of that and also Continue. the <laughs> a bit, a bit of spiritual power mm, yes <laughs> spiritual it power has not a bit of, okay. true. from a layman's perspective like me I would expect my pastor mm. I mean to over, I mean to get out of our nominalism I would mm. expect my pastor to preach more on uh, personal purity mm. personal holiness and mm. uh, character I actually there's so many topics to talk on mm -hmm. but if uh, you really want to come out of this nominalism mm -hmm. and uh, you know see quality Christians in every aspect of our society I think we need to stress more on the character of God and uh, personal uh, holiness. Yeah. Okay, uh, with the impact of media or the influence of the world all around us, so what has been the effect on youngsters or young people, you know? And also, uh, are they facing any pressure or what sort of pressures, you know, brother? As we all know, I mean, like the media has become like the extension of our skin, like mm -hmm. mobile phones or like 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 this mobile phone we can through this mobile phone we can go into the world of the media so like that's become more like a station of our skin and we you know coming to nominalism we prefer to you know all our time morning evening or like at night also we are into the facebook into all these social media gadgets you know and rather we are not reading the word of god even in the churches inside the church mm -hmm. people are browsing mm -hmm. the sermon seems so boring that's the excuse mm -hmm. and then inside the church they are browsing and then so that's a sort of nominalism and also you know uh, i mean like like i said i think social media is really one of the agent of yes, the e yes. e evil one yes mm -hmm. also that is very, affecting this very powerful affecting the youngsters yeah not only in the spiritual mm -hmm. life but in their social and political level or in the academic mm -hmm. life also mm -hmm. yeah. the content in the media is so powerful mm -hmm. that is uh, affecting the quality yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But again, uh, uh, I should say, like nearly 40% or even you get a lot of positive things, you get uh, the yeah, best yeah, teaching that is also the yes. of the world yeah. in yeah. this media. Yeah. But we are not knowing that we are yeah. just going mm -hmm. for entertainment or for, the, you know, uh, time pass. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like, yes, related to youth, like uh, mm -hmm. just something about peer pressure. Is there any peer pressure and is it leading to nominalism also? Yeah, like, say, like, of course, uh, coming to our social life, we can peer pressure again. Our parents, say like our elders, they are role, they are our role model. So when we, they don't live a godly life, mm. what do we expect from them? Mm. We become like them, like yeah. the, the youngsters. We become, we imitate our elders. Mm. So coming to these peer pressures again, most of the testimonies, so like we deal with different kind of people, with like we do counseling session, you know. So their testimony are like the parents. Mostly the the culprit are the parents, mm. or like the elder ones who have mistreated them, or who have lived a who have, who have who have not lived a godly life. Mm. So from that point, uh, we can get that they are really into their parents, and then mm. the parents are the role model. Mm. So one thing I can suggest or I can say is that we need godly parents in our generation and godly parenting, mm. so that Good. the youngster will imitate them and then be a role model. Mm. Very true. Mm. The pull of the world mm. through the media and all the ma social media. I think so. We, instead of just uh, blaming social media, we should train them to be selective. Exactly. Because there, are, like good. you said, many good things there, mm. many informations. Otherwise, they are bombarded with all kinds of information. It changes their mindset. Exactly. And another thing is that we just touched already, is that some churches are becoming really boring. So the church is not there to entertain. But if so, there are real trained people, they speak with authority, spiritual power, and they know their subject, then there won't be a boring moment. That's not to into them, but if the Word of God is properly dispensed, people love to hear it, people yes. come. True. But true. that kind of church, we're in short supply. Mm -hmm. So that's a, 
that we need something to work on. Mm. And we, but right now, the way the, the, our setting is that we have tribal churches and all that, so we say they have captive audience. Whether the past, they like the pastor or not, they have to go there anyway. <laughs> right. That kind of thing goes on. But another trend is that now, especially Dimapur and Kohima, some churches are doing away with that. They're not even affiliating with multi community yeah. or multi independent churches. Independent yeah. churches yeah. coming out. The way they, they like to worship and all that. Mm. But so long as they're not into deviation or cults like mm. that, I think we need to mm. give them a little space, yes. some space to move on. Yeah, exactly. that's, that's my thinking. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, like, is it also because uh, our churches have uh, captive audiences, especially our community churches, mm. so they are easygoing or they, they, yeah. they, mm. they become complacent, laid back? Okay. They don't demand perhaps much of their, from their spiritual leaders. leaders. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that some, yeah, some so that what could be true. the remedy also? You know, I mean, for example, these tribal churches. I think they need yeah. to they need to introduce some fresh leaders along with the senior pastor. Let that be the senior pastor, but program with the and freedom to move. Have some creative program to capture mm -hmm. the youth. Mm -hmm. So the older generation, they're satisfied with the way their old pastor is. Mm -hmm. They're the one. The, they have the money. They have the, oh, the controlling the committee and all that, and they don't open up for the younger generation. Mm -hmm. They have. They think they're they have the right. They think they're right, and they don't want to move. They don't want to shake, you know. Mm. So we cannot put new wine in old wine skin. So that's the situation coming up. But yes. But that could be contributing to some nominalism because I'm telling you, young people are disillusioned with some churches. They are not going because they say boring. Yeah. Okay. Perhaps I'll ask examples from Doctor. Yeah. Well. yeah he's, he has uh, something to say. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Please. Regarding your question, no? mm. is there a way out? Uh, this is the way I see presently. We seem to be lacking in prophets in Nagaland. Too many believers, too many pastors, but then uh, somehow the prophetic voice seems to be sadly missing. Man of God who knew the times, discerning the times, and you know, speak to according to the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what actually is needed, to my uh, opinion. And if we have this type of people, I think it can, uh, we can really wake up again from our complacency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we have this kind of people in our mainline churches? Because we know a lot of independent churches are also nurturing this, but uh, what about our mainline churches? Mainline churches, some are doing really good. Some are, uh, for, for example, Union Baptist Church, though I'm not very much involved there. I think they have some creative programs that are but the what power come or what not they are going to communities where hardly there are churches and they are reaching out to the hostel people people living in the hostels uh, teenagers and young ladies and guys mm -hmm. in hostels uh, giving them services i heard that so that's a good yeah. thing they are doing creative, like Liria, creative or, ministry yeah. a lot mm -hmm. of it but of course in terms of hostel one can say that I even these are almost like a captive audience <laughs> yeah <laughs> but still then it's but still programming has not been given to them or yes. if they have their own program they're run by just people sharing that's good thing still the the real world is not explained to fed to the people yeah actually yeah in terms of hostel ministry a lot of churches or ministries are also reaching out to them oh, including wonderful. NBCC youth mm. but uh, in terms of uh, older generation and younger generation leaders uh, do you have something to say, Jose? So I heard there is a very good older generation pastor you have, as well as somebody coming up. Please give us an example from your church. Let, me, let, let not this be a by statement, but coming to my church, you know, we have a, our senior pastor. Mm -hmm. His name is Reverend Johui. Johui Neka. And then How old is he? He's 85. He'll be mm -hmm. in his 85 mm -hmm. years. And then he has really lived a godly life. Mm -hmm. And then, like, his testimonies are such that we need we need this kind of people even in our midst you know, I mean like when he was an evangelist he walked from you know food from village to village mm. and then you know his stories his, one of his stories say that he even raised a date not him but God through him mm -hmm. so like that when he, he tells his stories to us like this it really intrigued us and really challenged us so uh, even these days he, he used to challenge me you, you young people you need to learn how to walk Mm. You need to have this patience, the zeal. Don't only, uh, don't only think of comfort zone, but think about how to reach to many people. That's how he used to challenge us. So I think, I guess, like, this kind of people, we need more. Mm -hmm. And also, there are many young 
young leaders they are coming up and I really appreciate it and then they have an open mind and then they I mean like what I can say or suggest is that we need more interaction with, from the church leaders and the and the in the congregation because there are many things we can't share or like there should be a platform or there should be certain programs where we can interact with the audience and we with the congregation of the church and also set some I mean like set some uh, creative programs or like sessions also okay. where okay. the young people can share their minds mm -hmm. well sometimes necessarily the older generations are not against but we need to explain to them and give the youth a chance you know to for creative programs i think that's a good way of transitioning to me okay okay, <coughs> okay. Okay, that was uh, very informative and interesting so far. So before we come to the ending, is there any last words from any one of you? Okay, I just remember just a quotation made by my friend. I mean, coming to the nominals in the church, where he quoted like this, like, the poor are like a plastic in the church. You know, they are blown like, by the rich from here to there. So I think this this quotation really makes sense. Where the, the lower group of people there there seems to be a caste system in the church also these days mm. and that's very apparent mm. and no one can mm. deny that mm. so i think we should really the leaders should really you know uh have a the, the leaders should not have a biased you know biased exactly. uh, mm. attitude towards the congregation because all are one in christ there is no jews no gentiles in the church mm -hmm. so i think we should treat all the congregation you know equally mm -hmm. that's what i want to suggest very important yeah. that's a wonderful yes. point well Many points that we discussed by one topic itself, we can go on for a long time, but today we're just touching the issues here and there. So let me summarize it by saying that one needs to know that one is truly born again or truly in Christ, and that we need fasting and prayer to address to come of nominalism, that we need proper teaching of the word, and Tuli rightly said about having a prophetic voice for the churches. So to sum it up, let's say, like Paul Little, he wrote in a little book, he says, know what you believe and know why you believe. I think if we address those issues and walk by faith and faithfully after learning all those things, I think a lot of things will change and nominalism will fade away. Mm. That's my yeah, idea. Exactly. Mm. And I believe it's not an easy walk, the walk of faith. So we all try our best and sometimes we fall, but at to the best of our ability and to the best of our spirit, we, we, we by faith will go on that we'll come out victorious. Amen. Thank Amen. you all. Amen. Thank you. Mm.